That's great. It's good. It's like a surround sound when it comes from behind. Thank you guys so much. Uh, my name is Casey Winstead. I am the lead student pastor here at Geyer Springs. I will be teaching this sermon. So that means that you can't leave. We now know that you're in here. So if you choose to go out the back doors, we're going to write your name down. We're going to get your address, and then we will send you a copy of today's sermon. <laughs> hey, so all, all joking aside, what a beautiful picture of, of two seniors leading up here. We've got a student, a senior over here playing guitar. I just want, we want everybody in the church to experience what we experience week in and week out with Geyer students. God has blessed us with some incredible students. Every single one of these students that walked across the stage have gifts and use them for the glory of God. And so you get to kind of taste that today. And, and we just want to share that. We want to share what God has been doing in Geyer students. But, but please hear me, today's message is not just directed to seniors. Like, it's a very special day. Like, we're honoring our seniors for all of their hard work and as Max alluded to earlier, we're not talking about his seniors. Now, if you are one of Max's seniors, first of all, I pray extra for you. But today we're honoring our seniors who have graduated high school and, and those seniors who have graduated college. And listen, if you check both the boxes of graduating high school and you're in Max's ministry, we want to congratulate you today as well. All right, you are, it is not lost on you. But I wanted to take an opportunity to not only challenge our students uh, as they are graduating and moving into this next step, this next phase of life, but I also want to encourage our congregation. I want to encourage our body. In, in this room in the worship center, uh, everyone who is watching upstairs in the venue, if you are at home watching this, this is a message that is specifically crafted for you, for every single one of us. Because no matter what stage of life you find yourself in today, there's three principles that I want to share with you that I think this morning are powerful and life-changing if you would agree to try and pursue these. Now, we all know that life takes work. We all know that there's things that we have to do. And so that's what I want us to talk about. When I think about sending seniors out, one of the most exciting things is the experience of what's next. So if you've been a graduate of high school, you know what I'm talking about the unknowns. Maybe it's the unknowns of going to a college campus. Maybe it's the unknowns of going into the military and serving our country. Maybe it's the unknowns of going into a career field or maybe taking a year off and figuring out what's next for your life. But when you graduate from high school and you enter into this next stage, there's so many unknowns. And so each senior here this morning will take that next step. And that step is going to put you right in the middle of community. See, we're currently in a series called The Art of Neighboring. And I didn't want this just to be a, a senior Sunday message, but I want this to be a continuation of where we picked up last week. Last week, we talked about the importance and the ideas of the art of neighboring. And some of you have been challenged to deal with your neighbors. And you're like, I don't like my neighbors. I can't talk to my neighbors. I can't stand my neighbors. And God specifically put those neighbors around you and the community that you're in because he wants you to neighbor to them. And so there's some things that God calls us to that we may not like, we may not love, we may not want to do, but it doesn't change the fact that we have been called to do something by God. And so the premise behind this series is that we have some things in our lives that we need to work on in order to be better neighbors. Seniors, there's some things that you have to work on in the community that you're about to be placed in that's going to help you become better neighbors. Neighbors in dorm rooms, neighbors on campuses, neighbors in the cities in which you attend college or where you work. Because what we want to do at Geyer Students is we don't want to send students out after spending six years with us and then them just existing in the world. We don't want students to just graduate and leave Geyer Springs and then just have a feeling or an experience. I tell people this Student ministry is one of the most difficult jobs, but I think it's one of the most important jobs in the church. And it's not to knock on any other ministry. We have incredible pastors, and we have incred incredible ministries here at Geyer Springs, but this is why I say that. Because when we get them, they are children. And then today, as you saw, these are adults that are being sent out into the world. And so as we connect children into adulthood, we have a responsibility of setting them up in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and then saying, how can you use this to better your community. See, what we want to do is we want our students, we want our church, we want our body and our members 
to be an asset for the future, not a liability. And so that is our hope in Geyer students. That is our goal. But part of being an adult is accepting the choices that you make. Not only accepting them, but owning them. Abraham Lincoln, he's kind of a big deal. He said this one time. He said, you cannot escape the responsibility of tomorrow by evading it today. Seniors, there are things that are coming. There are choices that have to be made. And you can't continue to put them off. And I'm not talking about like what classes you take and things like that. I'm talking about taking a stand for what is right and what God has called you to. But see, adults in this room, the same is true for us. You can't put off talking to the neighbor tomorrow or next week when God says, no, I need you to do it now. A perfect example in my life is that I live in a neighborhood. I know all the neighbors that are around me, but I don't have deep relationships with them. And so last week, whenever Pastor Day was talking and sharing this, this idea of neighboring, it was on my heart, like, I've got to connect deeper. And some of you may have been there this week. You're like, I know their name, so check the box, but I don't know them. And my neighbors aren't the people who are out all the time hanging out, and this is how the Holy Spirit works. You're like, how do you know God's real? Let me show you. I pray the prayer, I go home, and I look, and my neighbors, who don't hang out a whole lot, are outside with their kids and every toy I think they own in their house and they're just playing. And God's like, you know the move. You know what you have to do, right? I'm like, I have to mow. That's what I have to do. I have to bring my grill out to the front, right? Like, no, all I had to do was walk over there and just talk to them. But it was a beautiful picture of how God works in our lives. But I can't put off tomorrow and say, hey, listen, I'll talk to them later. I'm really busy. See, we have to own the choices that we make and do the things that God has called us to do. We are responsible for what we do in life and how we respond to what life gives us. And so if you like to take notes, I do. If you're like, hey, we used to put notes on the screen. I wish we did that. I'm your guy, okay? Because I work with people who get distracted all the time. And so I have three things that I want to challenge you. Write down, prick your finger, like do it in blood. Whatever you have to do, type it in your phone, text it to your spouse, Carve it in the pew. I'm just kidding. Don't, don't do that. If it happens, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're good points, though. They, it, all right, you guys get it. Hey, the first one is this, is that we need you to own your faith. Seniors, adults, everybody in the room, anybody that hears this, you have to own your faith. It's something that I tell students all the time. See, I cannot make a spiritual decision for anybody in this room. I wish I could. Man, it would be so much easier to be a student pastor. I'm like, I want you to be a Christian. I made that decision. I want you to read your Bible. I want you to trust God in every aspect of life. But the reality is, is that I can't do that. That's what makes ministry hard. That's what makes being a follower of Jesus hard, is that I can't make decisions for people. I can't make spiritual decisions for anyone. But your parents can't make spiritual decisions for you. Your teachers cannot make spiritual decisions for you. You are the only person that can make a spiritual decision for yourself. That goes for anyone hearing this message this morning. The only person that can make a decision for you when it comes to spiritual things is you. And so we kind of have this idea that the church is supposed to be the one who makes those choices. Young people, their ideas are formed by what their parents tell them, but the reality is at some point you will not live in your parents' house, hopefully. Hopefully you go out into the world and you have a career and you have your own family, but you have to make your own decisions spiritually. You have to own your faith. Because what happens is, is that we have a world that is very strongly opinionated about all kinds of things. And they have these things that they believe in, and they have, they have desires and passions. And what you don't understand is that if you're not the one who's spiritually influencing yourself, someone else will. If you're not firm in your faith, you are in trouble. Because if you don't own your faith, ultimately someone's faith is going to own you. Someone else's faith is going to own you if you don't know why you believe what you believe. A couple weeks ago, we did a series with our students in apologetics, and we talked about this idea of how do you know that you're a believer? How do I truly know that I am saved? But then we took it a step further. How do I defend my faith? And I think it's an important thing for all of us to know and not just say, because one time I asked Jesus into my life. Like, how do you know that God is real? 
And what we have to do is we have to set up these spiritual markers in our lives, like the moments where God showed up and say, this right here, this was a moment in my life. For some of you seniors, when you go to this next phase of life, you're going to experience some spiritual markers. I think about the Israelites as they're going across the Jordan. These tribes set up these stones in the Old Testament, as we see in Joshua, and they set these stones up because they wanted to remember the moment that they crossed into the Jordan, that God showed up, and they said that was a moment where God showed up. We, we go through life so often, and, and we just discredit the power of God, and we discredit how good God is, and we forget to remember that God is actively working in our lives. And so part of owning your faith is having these spiritual markers. And, you know, and, it, and they can be small or they can be massive. You know, for me, last week, a spiritual marker was me praying a prayer that I could connect with my neighbors and them coming out in the driveway. That was the moment where God showed up. For some of you, God shows up in hospital rooms. For some of you, God shows up in the middle of a meeting. For me, when I was a a freshman in college, God showed up. I surrendered to the ministry. I was an engineering major. I loved it. I was good at math and science. I knew this is what God had for me, I thought. But then God shows up and he says, this is not it at all. And I told God, listen, I'll do whatever you want as long as I don't preach and as long as I don't teach. (laughs) Spoiler alert, I was wrong. But it was a beautiful reminder that God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who's in control. And so seniors, part of owning your faith is accepting that God is the one who's in control of that. God is the one who guides your paths. In the Bible, we see in Matthew chapter 7, we see Jesus is teaching like the sermon of all sermons, the sermon on the Mount, and as he is going through it, he concludes with Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, and he's talking about building your house on the rock. And so in verse 24, it says this, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built their house on the rock. I don't know about you, but I would love to be considered a wise person. I don't want people to look at me and be like, yeah, he, he, he doesn't have it all going on up there. I want to be someone who is full of wisdom. And so Jesus is saying this is the marks of wisdom. And in verse 25, he says this. He says, and the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat on the house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. In verse 26, it says this. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. In verse 27, it says, And the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat against the house, and it fell. And it says, And great was the fall of it. And that's kind of where we cut that off, but I want to just read something else that, that really sticks out to me in this passage. In verse 28, just the next verse, it says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. What a beautiful thought. How many times do we leave church and we are astonished? Not at the words that come out of my lips or out of Pastor Dave's mouth, but at the teaching of God. How often do you get in the word and then you walk away astonished? I think a lot of times we look at reading scripture as some sort of a chore or some sort of a checklist. And this is how we connect with our creator. This is how we connect with our savior. And so as we read scripture, we need to walk away from it like, wow, like I, God, I I see what you're doing in scripture. I see what you're doing in my life. And man, I I have no words at all. What would that look like if you walked away from scripture astonished at the teachings of God? You see, Jesus is teaching this parable and he lets them know the importance of having a firm foundation. Where we build our house ultimately determines the outcome. If we want to be successful in not only leading ourselves but also leading our families, but also leading our communities, we have to own our faith. It's something that we have to do as a body of believers. We come together and we say, you know what? This is what scripture says, because a lot of times we love to get on Facebook. We love to get on Twitter. We love to get on social media and tell everybody what we think. We're so opinionated. Everybody has an opinion about something. Hey, students, let me just help you out real quick. Just a pro tip. Don't do that. It's not a good look. Now, you can stand up on your faith and say, this is what scripture says. Because there's so many social issues and there's so many moral dilemmas that we find ourselves in. But what I know is this, is if I stand on the word of God, 
I don't have to apologize for anything. It's a beautiful feeling. Hey, this is what scripture says, not what Casey says, not what the news tells me, but this is what the word of God says. Not only own my faith, but having that firm faith, like the house that was built on the rock. Here's the second thing, is that we have to own our relationships. These are, these are quick points, so if you are carving them in the pews, you got time. <laughs> the people you develop relationships are oftentimes the people that you look like. We all know this. The people that you spend time with are who you begin to imitate. The people that work near me say some of the same things that I say. And they never said that stuff before. And it's silly stuff. Like, for instance, I don't like to say the word very. That's very important. I don't say that. I shorten it. I say that's V important. I don't know why I do it. This is how God created me. It's just a silly thing I do. But my coworkers will be like, that's V important. I'm like, that sounds really weird. I guess that's what I sound like. But the reality is, is we pick up what other people do. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, it says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Hey, young people, you have a choice coming up. You will pick your friends, or your friends will pick you. But you better pick some people that you want to look like, because that's what you're going to imitate, the people that you find yourself around. See, owning a relationship looks like you are the person that is in control. You can't let your relationships own you. You have to own them. Another example of this, how you become like other people. When I got married, I folded shirts one way. I would grab them at the shoulders. I would turn them in and fold them in a square. It was perfect. Like I could get a job at any retail store folding shirts. But then I married my wife, and that's not how she does it. She gets the sleeves, and then she puts them in the middle, and there's like a line down the middle, and then she folds them. And what I learned was, this can go one of two ways. <laughs> I can do my laundry for the rest of my life and not change. Or I can change the way that I fold my shirts and we're going to get along. And you know what? I fold my shirts down the middle. And the reason is, is because I was influenced by the relationship that I have. And that seems silly but a lot of times we change something we've done our entire life because of the people that we find ourselves around. And so young people, the things that you stood on as a believer in the church doesn't mean that when you get out of church and you go to college, you're going to continue to stand on those things because the people you surround yourself are going to be the people that you imitate. Now, I know that sometimes adults get set in our ways, but the reality is, is this. Maybe there's some relationships that you have to own that I have to own. I have to say, listen, this has gone on for too long. This is not a healthy relationship. Maybe there's relationships that have to be reworked and mended. Maybe it's relationships with family members. Maybe it's relationships with neighbors in the community. The, the, the art of neighboring is to love people. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. And man, we love me, right? We love ourselves. You know how I know that? Because everybody talks about themselves. We do. It's because we know the most about us. We love to tell people about us. Or an extension of us, look at my grandkids. Look at my, my children. Look at my dog. Like, it's, it's us. We're self-consumed people. This is who we are. But I think the reality of owning relationships is letting other people in them and realizing that you're not always the most important person in the room. And that's hard for us to accept because in our minds, we all know we're the most important person in the room, right? We know that. But the part of being a good neighbor is letting other people be the most important person in the room. And see, when we allow others to own the relationships, your ability to be a leader is no longer there. You have now conceded to being a follower. The people that you surround yourself with are the people that you begin to look like, the people you begin to act like, the people you begin to talk like the people that you begin to ultimately live like. So be wise in the people that you surround yourself with. Also be wise in not allowing people to lead you to places that you don't want to go or be led by people who don't own their faith. Be wise in these people. And here's the third thing. You have to own your decisions. See, very early on in life, my parents told me, they sat me down and said, listen, you are responsible for the choices that you make. Casey, the choices that you make, those are your choices. It's nobody else's. 
And it still hasn't changed. As I get older, I'm responsible for the choices that I make. But man, we love, I think, like, I love baseball. It's America's pastime. But I think if we had to have like a new pastime, it would be blaming other people for our problems. Because we all do it, and we love it, right? You're a bad driver, so it's someone else's fault. You get pulled over because you were speeding. How dare the cop do that, right? Like, we get so upset. The food was not good at the restaurant, so it must be someone else's fault. Never mind the fact you ordered something weird and it shouldn't be on a plate anyways. <laughs> but as we think about this, we are so quick to blame other people. We got to blame somebody. If, if you live at home by yourself, get an animal. You got to blame somebody. We know some people who have a fake person, and that's who they blame. They've got a name, and they're like, so-and-so, that's their fault. It's not a real person. They literally blame it on nothing, but it has helped them as a couple. Sit there and blame each other. I'm like, that's weird, but I get it, because we love to not be the one who is at cause, the one who is at guilt. And so what we have to understand is, is that when we own our decisions, we have to actually do that. We actually have to own them. We see this from the very beginning of time. Adam and Eve commit a sin against God, and instantly it becomes the blame game, right? Eve, the snake made me do it. The serpent, he's so deceptive. And Adam's like, she did it. And Eve's like, seriously? I thought we were in this together. Like this great, just happy couple. And they're like, nope, uh uh-uh. They're just waiting. That is what sin looks like. And so we're so quick to give the yeah, but answer. My kids, four and seven, yeah, but, yeah, but, all the time. I'm like, Taylor, did you do that? Yeah, but, yeah, but what? She's like, well, I don't know. So something will come to me. Did you do that to your brother? Did you hit him? Yeah, but he looked at me. I'm like, this is an aggressive move, but okay. Right? Son, did you eat those cookies I just told you not to? Like, we're about to have dinner. Yeah, but I'm hungry. We do the yeah buts all the time. We have to own the decisions that we make. How sweet would it be to own the good decisions more often than the not so good decisions? See, God is not shocked by our failures. He's well aware, and that is why he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us. Because he knew we'd be like, yeah, but what if that was how Jesus operated? I'm going to die on the cross for you. You're like, for me? He's like, yeah, but actually just kidding. Not you. I'm going I'm to give this to someone else. See, Jesus owned the decision. As his father says, this is what you're going to do. And we understand that he struggled with that. He's like, listen, if this cup could pass, let it. But if not, I'm going to own this. I'm going to do this. And he knew what was happening. And it's this beautiful picture of someone owning a decision that forever changes the picture of eternity. I tell students all the time, direction determines your destination. Think about the choices that you make. This is going to determine where you go for the rest of your life. Young people, the career field that you go into, the degree that you pursue, that's going to shape the the, the direction that you go in life. Some of you are going to start dating in college. Let me just tell you, a lot of times that leads to a spouse. That's going to determine where you go for the rest of your life. We don't think about it when we're younger But the older you get, you're like, yeah, I hate that I'm an engineer. I don't want to do this anymore. But when I was 19 years old, I made this choice. And here I am now because the decision determined the direction. If I want to get to Texas, what I have to do is directionally point my car west, hop on I-30, and drive. If I want to get to Texas, I can't go east. You're like, well, the the, the world is round and you'll eventually get there. No, no, like, just cut all that out. That's nonsense. Okay? (laughs) I'm not driving through the ocean. I have a Honda Accord. It ain't going to make it. If I want to get to Texas, I have to go west. And a lot of times what we do in life is we know where we want to go, and then we point ourselves to the complete opposite direction. And we're like, I might get there. I'll eventually get there. That's foolish. It's not wise. Look back to the house that was built on sand. There was a lot of yeah, but opportunities. Like, yeah, but I, I didn't know. I'm not a home builder. How am I supposed to know? And as he's teaching this parable, we do this a lot of times. We find our, like, deficiencies, and then we use that as an excuse. Or or maybe the person who built their house on the sand was like, man, but I got a deal. Do you see this housing market? Oh, my gosh. 
They were practically giving it away. And you know it costs so much money to buy something now. And so I had to make that choice or I didn't think it would happen to me. Like these are so common and all these responses are ultimately a response to not owning your decision. If you do not build your house on a solid foundation, when the storms of life come, there will be a fall. And and I just want to let you know whether you are graduating high school or you are in preschool and you're like, I don't know what he's talking about, or you are in Max's ministry, you are like wherever you fall in all of this, storms will come in your life. It's just, it's just going to happen. We will have troubles. We will have heartache. And what we have to do is say that my foundation is firmly rooted in Jesus. But also, like, own decisions to do great things. Own decisions to make an impact in your community. Own decisions to say, not only am I going to be a good neighbor, but I'm going to be one who puts the needs of my neighbors before my own. See, when God calls you to something, own that decision. Don't just be like, yeah, but God, like, I don't think I can do that. Do you know who you're talking to? He's like, I know exactly who I'm talking to. I created you. And so as I look at this senior class who lined the front of the stage, God is calling you to something incredible. And it may not be to stand up here and sing. It may not be to to stand here and share the word of God. But what God has called you to is to use the skills and the gifts that he has given to you to grow his kingdom. Live with confidence in knowing that you are being obedient to the calling of God. Every single one of us have been called by God to do an amazing thing. But if I fail to own my faith, if I fail to own my relationships, if I fail to own my decisions, I'm going to fail to do what God has called me to. No matter what stage of life you are in, these are the things that we have to own. And when we begin owning our faith and our relationships and our decisions, that's when we start to see kingdom growth happening. Picture a college freshman, all right? Maybe you were a college freshman at one time and you're like, (laughs) picture this, that's a college freshman that stands firm in their faith and says, above all else, this is the most important book that I will ever have in college. All these other textbooks are great and I have all this head knowledge, but the heart knowledge that I find from scripture is what I'm going to stand on. But then they allow their relationships to be ones that glorify God. They surround themselves with people who encourage them. See, in life, there's two choices. Either you're going to point people to Jesus or you're going to push them away from Jesus. Imagine owning relationships that are pointing people to Jesus. Imagine having friends who are going to help you walk better in your life with Christ. But see, as we, as we picture this, think about one person, though, this college freshman, that, that then their decisions are ones that they make, and then five, ten years down the road, it's not decisions that are full of regret, but it's decisions like, man, I'm glad I did this. I'm glad I went to God with this. And I'm not saying that this is how you have your life all together, but what I am saying is this, is that this is a formula that's required for us to be someone who stands for something that is a desirable character trait. So what's the next step? I don't want to just like, hey, you said like own this, own that, get that, be a good neighbor. I hear you, man. Like what can we do? What, what do we need to do with all of this? Some of us need to own our faith. Like you have yet to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't care if you're 90 years old. If you've never given your life to Jesus, you have to own that faith. Maybe you, maybe you made a decision early on in life. I, I shared last week with a baptism. I had a student who, man, I, 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 I prayed a prayer. I did the walk down front thing, but man, nothing ever changed. There was no fruit in my life because I was acting on a feeling and, and it wasn't truly me wanting to be in a relationship with God. It was me trying to do what all my friends were doing. Some of us have to own our faith. Some of us in here are living out the faith of our parents, Oh, well, my parents just maybe come to church. I see this all the time with students. Why do you come to church? My parents make me. Do you want to be here? Nope. I can't stand it here. I don't like it. But going through life, I'm a Christian because I grew up in church. Some of us in here need to own our faith. Have you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? See, maybe today you make that decision to follow him. Maybe you're at home watching this and you're like, I, I need to do that. Like, we would love to talk to you. As pastors, you can text the number 9400, and you can say, hey, like, need to get saved, whatever. Tell us your name. One of our pastors will be in touch with you. Or if you want to do the old come down to the front and talk to somebody, I ain't stopping you, right? Find somebody, because some of us today have to own our faith. 
Maybe today you need to make the decision to follow him. Maybe you are a believer, but you're not owning your faith. You're just kind of wishy-washy. And you say, all right, today, May 2nd, it's, it's a new day, and I'm going to stand firm in my faith. I'm going to be the spiritual leader to my family. I'm going to be someone who is an influence in my community, and I'm going to stand on the word of God and let that flow through my life. Maybe what you need to do today is just refocus your attention on God and let him be at the center of it. Maybe for some people, it's the relationships that you have. You can't own them because they own you. Maybe there's some students who have unhealthy relationships, some guys with that girl that they know they don't need to be with anymore. Maybe there's some adults in here who, who maybe marriage is just kind of like on the rocks and you need to say, you know what, like I have to fix this. But the only way I can do that is owning this relationship and then giving it to God. Maybe there's some of you who have an estranged relationship with some family members or whatever it may be. Maybe it's some, some people who you haven't talked to your mom and dad in years and you needed to say, you know what, this was petty and I'm over it. I need to get connected with my family and own this relationship. Maybe it's coworkers. Maybe someone took a cell from you. Maybe someone talks about you behind your back and you just need to either cut it off or own the relationship and do that out of love. Maybe some relationships need to be ended. Maybe some relationships need to be started. Whatever this looks like, we have to take the next step. Maybe there's some people in here who you let guilt drive you from a decision that you've made. You, you made a choice and you can't seem to move on with your life. Anytime, like the, the enemy just puts it right back in your brain. I can't believe I did that. Maybe what you need to do is own the decision and say, all right, God, I'm going to use this to give you glory. Because God's not shocked. God's not surprised by our shortcomings and failures. But so often we try to hide them from him. We just, ah, I don't want you to see this. I don't want you to know about this. He's like, I created everything. I know exactly where you're at. Maybe today you need to accept the forgiveness of God, accept the decisions that you've made, but more importantly, accept the grace that God gives to us all. There is power in forgiveness, and there's power in accepting that forgiveness from God. Maybe there's people hearing this message today that need to take the next step of obedience and walk in what God has called them to do. Whatever it is, I would just challenge you to own it and then allow God to work through you in an incredible way.